In this session, I want to address the topic of faith and works. Uh, it's a topic that seems um, at times um, confusing to people. They kind of, uh, a lot of debate about faith and works. And there's a lot of circular argument that um, seems to take place around this. And those people that say that um, we're simply saved by faith view faith as simply believing something. And I believe that the Bible uh, teaches us that faith is more than simply believing something. Um, and so when they uh, say we're simply saved by faith, uh, um, then um, they often will point to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 to make their point, which reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. People that do this are trying to take one passage of Scripture, two verses, and make it prove their entire point. And that's not possible. Uh, there's nothing in Scripture that you can just basically say, that proves it. There's no such thing as a proofed text where you take one small passage of Scripture and that addresses the entire subject of the Bible on that topic. Um, so to say that there it says that we're saved by grace through faith and that ends it, uh, not from works. Well, we have to little understand a little bit more about what faith really is. And the interesting thing is the very next verse tells us a little bit of something about what faith is. Um, in uh, Walking in the Spirit, in a fourth session, I addressed Ephesians 2.10, which is the narrow, very next verse. I read to you Ephesians 2.8 and 9. In the next verse, Ephesians 2.10, after we read that we're saved by grace through faith, you know, not by works, then it says this in verse 10, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. So right after saying we're saved by grace um, through faith and not by works, it says, however, <laughs> you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So why are we saved by grace through faith? We are saved by grace through faith so that we can do good works. Um, if we are not doing the good works that God has planned for us to do, can we really say that we have surrendered our life to Jesus as Lord? Because that is the purpose for which he saves us. It was always his, his, his intent from the very beginning, because it says those good works were prepared in advance. From before we were saved, God planned on us doing good works as a part of or as a result of our salvation. So, we see that faith is not simply an intellectual agreement. Oh, I believe it, and that's all that there is to it. Um, faith, we see if um, ha faith is associated with action. If we believe something, if we have faith for something, then it causes us to act. If we don't really act on it, then can we really say we believe it? And that's what we see here in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works, but... When we are saved, there are these good works which God has always intended for us to accomplish. And that's the only way that we can carry out the plan that God has for us is to do the things that God has called for us to do. I'm going to read a fairly long passage of scripture, but this really uh, probably is the best passage on understanding the balance and uh, the cooperation between faith and works. In James 2 verses 14 through 26, it says this, what good is it, brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? We could also say works in place of deeds. Um, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? But someone will say, You have faith. Oops, I'm sorry, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that. And shudder, you foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered the son, his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Interesting statement. His faith was made complete by what he did. So we can see that faith complete or action 
complete faith. Going on. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friends. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What a great passage uh, on combining the understanding of faith and action, faith in deeds or faith in work. And he starts right off the bat in verse 14 and really is a fairly powerful and revealing question. Uh, James says, Can a person be saved simply by claiming to have faith and does not have any deeds? There's no works to go along with it. We just claim we have faith. In the very next verse, we see that, um, that um, this is really, well, in this verse, we see it's a form of what uh, I would think is a rhetorical question. This appears to be a, rhetor a rhetorical question. It, um, can a person be saved? Um, can a faith save a man without his deeds? Is that even possible? A rhetorical question is one that does not need to be answered because the answer is implied in the question itself. And I believe that when James asked this question, can such a faith save him, I believe the implied answer is no, it cannot. And we go on and we read why, because faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Um, in verse 15 through 17, James gives an example, and to drive home the point um, that uh, if we see a brother or sister in need and don't do anything to help them, um, what good is it? The faith, Our faith is no good. It's of no value unless it's actually used to accomplish something. And so... Um, it needs to be put into action. And here we, he, he used the example of a brother and sister in need in telling them to only be, be warm and well fed. Just telling them, not helping them, not actually doing it. And he says, really, that's, it's useless. That's a useless faith. It cannot be used. It is not productive. That to me says that that type of faith does not accomplish what faith is supposed to accomplish. What is faith supposed to accomplish? It's supposed to cause us to do the good things that God prepared in advance for us to do. Faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. We need to have faith and deeds. You cannot separate faith and deeds because true faith acts. True faith really uh, is um, put to work. It carries things out. In fact, we read in verse 22 that faith is made complete by our actions. Faith is made complete by what we do. It cannot be faith, fully faith, a saving kind of faith, unless it's completed by now saying, taking what we believe about Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, and then acting upon it. That completes our faith. That's a powerful uh, understanding when it says that uh, deeds or work completes our faith. We are not saved by deeds, but if we have true godly faith, it will manifest in ourselves working for the Lord. If we really believe it, then we'll put it into action. When James writes, show me your faith without deeds, he is making the point, it can't be done. He's challenging them to show me your faith without your deeds. And the reason he says it is because they know that they, they, they can't. It's not possible. It's not possible to show that you have faith without, your, without deeds. Um, and, and he says, you know, in, in verse 19, even the demons believe, <laughs> and it doesn't do them any good. Because they don't act on it in a godly way. They don't submit to Jesus and live um, a life that God would have them make them useful for the kingdom. So they can believe it, but it doesn't do them any good. It's of no value. It's as only valuable to us when we actually do what God has called us to do. Verse 20 says that we have faith, uh, if we have de faith without deeds, it's foolishness and useless. Um, the purpose of faith, we know, is to bring about our salvation. And if faith is useless, then that means it can't accomplish our salvation. We are saved by grace through our faith, but through our faith includes and is completed by our deeds, by what we do. Verse 21 and 22 makes James's point, and he uses Abraham. 
Abraham was labeled as a man of faith because he acted on what God told him to do. His action was completed when he went and was going to sacrifice um, Isaac. That completed his faith. And so that meant that he was found righteous in God's eyes. In verse uh, 24, drives his point home even more clear. You see that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. In fact, I, I would say there is no faith without action, which is what the Bible says. So the Bible does not contradict itself. There are no contradictions in the Bible. When James uh, 2.24 says that uh, faith has to be um, justified along with actions, it can't stand alone, and Ephesians 2.8.9 says we're saved by grace through faith, they can't be contradictory. The problem with uh, people that say that we're saved by faith and faith alone is that they don't understand what faith really is. And the word faith, biblically, does not mean that we just simply believe something. It means that if we really believe it, we act on it. And so that's what we're, what we're seeing here. And then verse 26, James says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You can't put it much more clearly than that. De faith is dead. If we don't have deeds, if we don't um, act on, if we don't do the things that God's called us to do and prepared for us to do, then our faith is dead. It, it can't, it, it, well, it's useless. It can't produce what it's supposed to produce. So faith and works, they go hand in hand. Um, but let's take a little bit more look, uh, just some scriptures that help us to understand this and kind of highlight it better. Um, of course, the, the chapter of faith, Hebrews 11, it gives us a little bit of insight. And it actually defines for us what faith is. Um, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients were commended for acting. They were, they, they were commended for acting on things that they may have not seen or understood how it was going to come to pass. But they believed God, and so they acted on it. They put it into action. They, 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 they carried out the deeds, the work that God had for them. So they were commended for their faith because they were being commended for their action. And that's interesting because it says we're, it's sure of what we hope for. If we really believe it, and that's the thing, if we really believe it, if we really have faith, we are sure that it's going to come to pass. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The reason that we know that we have faith is because we act on it. Even though we can't see something that God has called us to do, and the ancients were commended for this, we act on it. That's defined as faith. And so throughout the rest of that passage of Scripture, we see all these places where these, these men and women of faith acted on what God had told them to do. In fact, um, it says that they were still acting, um, you know, even though they didn't see it fulfilled, they still continued to live by faith. They still continued to act on what God had, had led them to do. 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6 says this, The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he, is, um, what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Well, walk, of course, is an action word. We're told that we must walk as Jesus did. Jesus went around doing good. We saw that, right? Healing all those who were under Satan's power. He went around doing. He went around acting. He went around involved, serving, carrying out the kingdom of God's mission. We're told that if we say that we really know him, and what we're saying here is that we really have a relationship with him, a saving relationship with him, then we are going to obey him. We're going to do what he commands. And we know that one of the things he has he's told us is he's prepared good works in advance for us to do. So if I really believe that, if I really know him, I'm going to be doing those things. Because that's what his word says that I should do. I can't say that I know him. I can't say that I even truly love him or his love is made complete in me if I'm not serving others. If I'm not doing what he's called me to do. It says, if I claim to live in him, I must walk as he walked. I must, have, I must act as Jesus acted. So Jesus didn't simply just set some down somewhere and say, I believe. Jesus was active in people's lives. Jesus was active in spreading the good news here on earth. 
Jesus was active in serving people. If I really know him as my Lord and Savior, if I really have that kind of saving faith, then I know that I need to walk as he walked. Luke 3 verses 8 through 14 says this, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not be, uh, begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food... <clears throat> should do the same. Tax collectors also <coughs> came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. <coughs> I've heard such teaching that um, John's re reference here to fruit refers to the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And so, um, it's thought by some that that's what it's talking about, produce those kinds of fruit. But we see that God's, uh, or John goes on to tell people exactly what he means by producing fruit. He says, serve one another. If somebody, um, you have two tunics and somebody has none, give uh, your a tunic to that person. If they're hungry, and you have food, give them food. He tells what the, the tax collectors, what they should do, what the uh, soldiers, what they should do. So he's telling them action. And so this is, we see the equation here of producing fruit with action. Produce fruit. Go to work in the kingdom. Produce something. That only happens when we work. And so when John writes that the axe is at the root of the tree, and every tree that doesn't produce fruit is going to be cut down, He's saying that every tree that does not uh, serve others, that does not care about others, that does not do the work of the kingdom, is not a tree that belongs in that kingdom. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. So we're told very clearly, if you want to use the term works, deeds, action, or in this case, the same word, uh, word that uh, John uses is produce fruit. He's telling them work. Be active. Accomplish something. Produce fruit. And if you don't produce fruit, you're in danger of being cut down and thrown into the fire. Romans 3.28, some people might look at this and say, well, that contradicts what you're saying. Well, let's look at it. Romans 3.28 says this, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Well, the issue there is, don't equate with observing the law with taking action by faith. People that say, well, this proves that we're not, we don't uh, work to be saved. You're right. That's not what this is saying. Observing the law is not about the same as being active in the kingdom. Observing the law is not the same as carrying out God's work, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Observing the law is ritualistic. Observing the law does not accomplish anything real. It doesn't produce real fruit in the kingdom of God. It's simply ritualistic. Working by faith is what really accomplishes uh, things in the kingdom. It's what causes the kingdom to be advanced. That's not the same as observing the law. Observing the law was simple, simply uh, ritualistic, and it did not produce anything. So do not confuse what it says here in Romans 3.28 that um, we're justified by faith apart from observing the law don't equate observing the law with same as working, because they're not the same thing. Let's take a look at another example of working by faith uh, before I kind of close things here. And again, it's a long passage of Scripture, but I always believe in handling uh, the Bible in context. And this is from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a sh shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, 
You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in, and in need of clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The, kingdom, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you have done for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or in sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is a long passage of scripture, but it's very clear in what it says. He says, because you were not willing to act upon what you claimed was your faith. You said you believed me. You said you were one of mine, that you followed me, that I was your Lord. But you wouldn't act on it in caring for other people. You would not serve others. And because of that, he says, you have no part with me. In fact, you're going to go to eternal punishment. Who is it that he says uh, can come into eternal life? It's those who acted. It's those who put into practice what they say they believed because that action, that work, completes their faith. A long passage of scripture, but it's powerful. It's powerful. Now, as pastors, what is your role? Your role is to prepare God's people to do works of service. I'm not saying that if you see somebody in need and you're the only one around, that you shouldn't meet that need. But primarily, your role is to prepare other people so that when they see these needs, that they work to meet those needs. We think sometimes as pastors we need to go out and work and do every act of service that our people do. But the truth is, it actually is less productive when we do that. Because if I put so much time into going out and doing all of the works of service as a pastor, then I'm not really prepared myself I'm not uh, feeding myself and spending time with the Lord. I'm not um, prepared to teach. I'm not uh, doing my role in spending time with other individuals, preparing them. And so what we're really learning is that when we prepare God's people to do works of service is we're multiplying what can be accomplished in the kingdom of God. Don't feel guilty if you're not doing every single act of service yourself. Because you can only do what one person can do. But your role and your as job as a pastor is to multiply yourself by preparing God's people for works of service. So that when they see these kinds of situations, people in need, they will know when, where, and how to act to meet those needs. And by doing so, you're giving them the opportunity, you're helping them to hear from the Lord, enter into this eternal reward enter into eternal life. If you don't prepare them and they don't do it, then they might be in danger of being the goats and not the sheep. That's your role as a pastor. Try to always keep that in mind. People will push against you. People will want you to be doing all of these works of service. But if you do that, you're actually shorting and making the kingdom of God less productive. Don't let that, with sound teaching, explain to them why this is your work of service, and you're happy to do it, because you want to work for the Lord. It's the completion of your faith. 
the completion of their faith is to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for them to do. Faith and works, they go hand in hand. It's not faith or works. And I'm not even sure if it's right to say faith and works. It's faith works. They go together. You cannot, biblically, you cannot have faith without works. It's not possible. They, they complete one another. Faith works. Not faith and works, not faith or works, but faith works. Both must be present in order to have true saving faith.